about the kind of internet retail company landscape. We've seen 12 of those companies have gone public this year versus nine from last year. The performance has been mixed. What's the pipeline? What's the trend? How are they performing? Yeah, if you think about the IPO market more broadly, across the board, 2020 was a blockbuster year. We had more, more uh, IPOs than, than more capital raised than in history. And then we saw 2021 already eclipsing those numbers. What's unique about this time and very different from what we talk about when we look back at the dot-com era is the, is the breadth of types of companies. And so, as you mentioned, we're seeing internet tech, we're seeing consumer tech, we're seeing uh, healthcare. There's so many different industries going public right now. As the markets have become a little choppier and we're seeing investors become more discerning about which companies they're supporting, the pipeline continues to be really, really strong. Some companies are choosing to wait a few, a few quarters before they go public, but there's still a lot lined up in, in the short term. And, and we're excited to welcome Warby today uh, here at the NYC via direct listing. They're also thinking about how they go public, not just when. Stacey, I noticed you're wearing your glasses. I feel this is appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit about, uh, about the direct listing. You say the markets are getting a little choppier. Does the, does the DL, does the direct listing become more attractive in choppy markets? Do you think more companies will go down this route? That's a great point. We're already seeing more and more companies considering a direct listing. But when you're not pricing shares and you're not selling shares into the market, you're a little less concerned about what the market conditions might be. You're allowing investors to, to price the, the company, but there aren't new shares being sold. And so it does, it is attractive when, when markets might be a little bit more volatile. We are seeing more companies choose a direct listing, not just because of market conditions though, because of their, their priorities. So the cost of capital uh, is, is significantly better in a direct listing because you're allowing the, the overall market to participate. And that democratization of access to that initial listing is a really big important driver for many companies who want all investors to have a level playing field as, as they hit the public markets. Hey, Stacey, I, I hear your point about direct listings, and so you're somewhat immune from the volatility within the markets in some capacity. But if we get the trajectory of, like, yields really rising and other assets really repricing for that, do you think that that materially impacts the space? You know, it's, it, I, I think not so much for direct listings. It's just the capital markets attracting attracting uh, investors. And, and there are drivers for why there are so many companies looking to go public. If you rewind back to the spring of 2020, nobody would have expected that we would be uh, in such a busy IPO calendar. But it was very expensive during that time in the early days of the pandemic to raise money in the private markets. And the public markets were providing access to capital to companies who needed it urgently, desperately, and they needed it really efficiently. And the public markets were really on display. So now we've seen a lot of companies recognizing the value of the public markets. Yes, certainly interest rates are playing a role in that as well. But there are companies that are looking to be public because they're not quite sure. I and mean, we're coming off at a, at a 10, 11 year bull run market where a lot of companies recognize the fact that conditions might not, might, might not be within their control over a period of time. And they're looking to tap into that capital so they can continue to grow and expand their businesses despite conditions. Stacey, we're starting to see some SPACs giving back money to investors. Do you think that is a sign maybe the peak SPAC is behind us? I, I, I think peak SPAC is behind us. If you think about the days where we might have a busy day and there were 20 SPACs going, going public at, uh, on a single day, uh, I don't think we're going to get back to those levels. There's been a bit of a reset, which is healthy for the market. You're seeing high-quality SPACs go to market. You're seeing high-quality business combinations get done. But when there are already 400-plus SPACs out there looking for business combinations, I certainly don't think we're going to see an acceleration uh, of those trends. And, and just like the rest of the market, investors are going to pick and choose the opportunities that they believe are going to deliver them the best returns. Hey, let's get to the actual nuts and bolts of your business, Stacey. Um, I'm wondering where you see growth right now uh, in the trading business, or are there other areas that you need to be looking at? There's certainly a lot of opportunity still within the capital markets as well as in the trading business. A lot of the conversations that Chair Gensler is having about the markets and the way they function today are good for exchanges. Just think about the way exchanges trade today with, with more than half of trading in many busy stocks occurring off of exchanges in markets that aren't transparent and don't provide price discovery the way an exchange does. 
there's a lot of focus uh, from the regulators and, and others on bringing more transparency to our markets. That's good for the exchanges, since the exchanges are the, the ones that set prices. We're the only place where people are displaying their prices, which leads to a better result for investors. So moving markets and focusing on that fragmentation and addressing some of the drivers that are really keeping markets so fragmented today will be good and, and certainly an area of growth and opportunity. Another area of focus for us is ESG. Our companies and our investors are very focused on how they have, what impact they have in their day-to-day -day business and their investments long-term. So we work very closely with our listed company community along with the investment community on supporting initiatives around ESG. We recently announced a partnership yep. with the Intrinsic Exchange Group to that, to that goal also at, at, to meet the needs of our customers as, as their focus has shifted. Do you think we're now at the point where it's going to start getting a little more clarity on what is ESG and what isn't, what has been greenwashed and what hasn't? We're starting to see the rules getting tightened up. We're starting to understand uh, maybe what the rules of the road really are. Stacey, how much of, of what is classified as ESG right now really is? Yeah, it, it's a great point. I mean, if you, if you look at the, the number of, of professionally managed assets in the U.S., one in three dollars is invested in an ESG strategy, but not all, not all ESG strategies are created equal. And so that's why we provide a lot of data behind what our company is doing. We collect data at ICE across 500 different ESG metrics that investors can use to inform their decisions and have real visibility in, into what, into what uh, companies are doing to drive the change that they want to see.